culture in which women's sexuality and consumption and the exploitation of women's bodies, women's sexuality, to, to make thousands and thousands of dollars is just uh, in your face all of the time. So there is a real connection, not just an imaginary connection, but a real connection between the exploitation of women's sexuality and the engine that drives um, capitalist consumption. We sell cigarettes, we sell beer, we sell cars uh, by using images of, of, of women's sexuality in those ads. And if you pick up any popular magazine, what you see over and over and over again is the use of women's sexuality and increasingly the use of even adolescent sexuality and even sometimes pre-adolescent sexuality to sell products and to announce always that sex, women's bodies, uh, women's sexuality are a commodity that needs to be exploited. And how many times, you know, could we ask ourselves, did we have sexual intercourse with a partner in which we were not wholly sure that that intercourse was something that both of us in the room wanted to have? How many times did we coerce? And it may not have been a slap upside the head, right? It may not have been the threat that I ain't paying your bills this month, right? It may have been just that simply nudge that said, well, come on. Right? That part of what women are supposed to do are please men. That maybe those partners in those relationships says, well, I'm supposed to do this. And when you put a conversation of rape out there like that, and you get men to honestly talk about that, I don't think you'll have men that are so convicted that they're not rapists. So part of it has to be, how do we start pushing the language? that pushes the boundaries of what we understand as rape is not just these sensationalized violent attacks. Sexual violence is the most dramatic and the most destructive, speaking in a relativist sense, very cautiously, but it's very deeply embedded in the normativity of violation in our societies, in the ways in which violating is normal. Yes, it can be very frightening when you start to realize how powerless women are as a group, how vulnerable women are as a group, and how institutionalized systems are so set up to disadvantage women. It can be really scary when you start to see all those things and you start to realize the disadvantages that women face. Take Back the Night is when women and men join in a collective to honor the women who have been sexually assaulted as well as bring awareness to all the voices that have been silenced. Why don't we talk about the abusers? Why don't we name the abusers? Why do we talk about these occurrences in our quiet spaces but don't bring them to the attention of those persons who need to know about what's going on? When you try to support black men and, and go along with them in the struggle just for whatever, you know, race, whatever, but when you get down to our issues and we chastise you about what you're doing within the community, then they get upset with us. You know, when when is a good time for us to talk about it then? When is a good time for you to tell, for me to tell you that you're hurting me? And I know that it's not all black men because a lot of time with rape, for, especially with black men, because we know historically with them getting accused of raping white women, every time you say rape with a black man, it's like, you spit in his face, but like, when is the time for me to tell you about the people that have been raping me and for you to come together with me and take responsibility as a black man? There's always concern with protecting us, but when it comes time to help us to protect ourselves, you know, they feel like we're accusing them. I do believe in loyalty. I believe in loyalty to truth, loyalty to integrity, loyalty to respect for our elders. But I do not believe that we should be loyal to someone because they are African American if they dare to violate. What it really means to be a black woman or man of integrity. And how many times, right, in our minds, well, we may sit here and thought to ourselves, well, of course I'm not a rapist. 
but I've never raped anybody, right? Keep in mind in the public imagination, rape is some guy in a trench coat standing in the corner, right? Pulling somebody off the street and throwing them down a, a flight of stairs and having sex with them. I mean, that's what rape is, right? So there are whole folks that delegitimize anything that's called dating. As Dr. King said, you know, oppression of one is oppression of all. When you talk about sexism, black men are the people that we're protesting against. White men, black men, Chinese men, Puerto Rican men. It's, a, it's an issue that has to do with men and women. And it's very difficult, I think, for black men who are used to being um, viewed as victims of one kind of oppression. It's very difficult for them sometimes to see themselves in this new role as oppressors and to begin to work on that in themselves and then to reach out to help their brothers work on it as well. Somewhere tonight, there are groups of students who are talking about known events of sexual assault, and they're blaming the victim. They're asking questions like, why did she go over there? Didn't she know better? What was she wearing? How was she behaving? This is going on on college campuses across this country, victim blaming. When you see a woman who's making an accusation of sexual assault. It can be very easy, I think, to fall into this trap of saying, why was she doing this? What was she wearing? And finding some way to structure it to make it her fault, because that distances you from that woman. And you can say, well, this won't happen to me because I'm not doing those things that bad girls do. I'm not doing those things that those type of women do. I think that's much easier than recognizing that there's really not that much difference between you and her. And the wrong circumstances, the wrong day, the wrong whatever, can end you up in a situation pretty much like what happens to a lot of other women. When male privilege is allowed to go forward and demand and coerce any way that it wants, that that is the issue that we have to confront. And until black men in this case are serious about giving up black privilege, now, black men will tell you that they're not privileged. Mm -hmm. But they talk about privilege in comparison to their white male peers. Right? And in that context, OK. But that doesn't mean that black men don't have access to privilege in their own households, in their own communities, in their own institutions. And until we have that honest discussion about black male privilege, we are going to be having these conversations over and over again. We also know that on college campuses across the country, we know of young women who are involved in very unhealthy relationships where physical and emotional abuse is the norm. We know this, but we talk about it in our quiet spaces. In Durham, something happened to this woman, and no one in the black community or black communities in Durham wanted to touch her because she was not the right kind of victim if she hadn't been stripped. Right? And she hadn't had kids out of wedlock. By the way, where were her kids when she was out stripping, right? So she must be a bad mother. And to have Jesse Jackson, right? And, and one of Jesse's really great moments of recent years, to publicly talk about, well, we're gonna raise money to guarantee that this woman does not have to do this kind of work ever again. And I'm wondering, Jesse, are you also going to raise money and put forth public policy agendas that are guaranteed that other folks who don't do work that black elites don't find valuable, right, are also going to have money so that they can go to school and be good, productive citizens. 